Welcome to the HVMN Research Roundup. I'm Dr. Brianna Stubbs. With my scientific background in metabolism, specifically ketone metabolism, we'll be going down one of my personal favorite rabbit holes, the way that ketones affect inflammation, specifically the ketone body BHB or beta-hydroxybutyrate. It's one of the three ketone bodies and it's present at the highest concentrations in the blood. We'll go through three studies on this topic where I'll walk you through the research process, discuss and analyze the results and muse over the potential implications. Let's start from the top with a little bit of background on inflammation. I'm sure you've all heard a lot about it over the years, with it often being portrayed in a negative light. Well, since this study confirms inflammation may be the culprit, Meyer says that nutrition associated with inflammatory properties like alcohol and dairy and activities like meditation that are known to reduce it are imperative for treatment. It seems like we're always trying to reduce inflammation. Let's take a step back and paint a balanced picture as every process in the body has its purpose. Inflammation is the body's natural response to injury. A sequence of complicated interrelated events work to defend the body, ultimately bringing plasma proteins and phagocytes, which are white blood cells that engulf and consume foreign material, into the injured area for the purpose of initiating tissue repair. Inflammation has also long been a well-known symptom of many infectious diseases, but molecular and epidemiological research increasingly suggests that it's also linked with a broad range of non-infectious diseases, perhaps even all of them. The association of inflammation with modern human diseases like obesity, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, cancer, remains an unsolved mystery of current biology and medicine. The inflammatory process evolved as a protective response to noxious stimuli, which is a fancy way of saying it might harm us, but inflammation unavoidably occurs at a cost to normal tissue function. So this fundamental trade-off between the cost and benefit of the inflammatory response has been optimized over evolutionary time for specific environmental conditions. The rapid change of the human environment that has occurred in the last hundred years or so outpaces genetic adaptation through natural selection, leading increasingly to a mismatch between the modern environment and selected traits. Consequently, the multiple trade-offs that were made over evolutionary time and affect human physiology are not optimized to the modern environment, leading to increased disease susceptibility. Inflammation can be classified in several ways, acute versus chronic, local versus systemic. Despite this complexity, all inflammatory responses can be broken down into four common components that align in a universal configuration of the inflammatory pathway. Inducers, sensors, mediators, and target tissues. Inflammatory inducers can be exogenous signals, for example, bacteria, viruses, or toxins, or endogenous signals, for example, ATP or uric crystals, which are fine for us if they're in the right place in our body, but trigger inflammation when damage means they leak into places they shouldn't be. These signals report on tissue stress, injury, or malfunction. Sensors can be cells, such as tissue resident macrophages and mast cells, or special protein complexes, such as the inflammasome. Sensors detect inducers with specific receptors and respond by producing inflammatory mediators. Depending on the nature of the inducers, sensors produce different combinations and amounts of mediators, creating a unique molecular signature for the inducer. These inflammatory mediators in turn act on the target tissues and alter their functional states, promoting elimination of the inducers, adaptation to the noxious state, and ultimately restoration of normal tissue function. So, do we want and need inflammation to survive? The answer is yes, absolutely. But it's one of those things I like to call a Goldilocks problem. We don't want too much, we don't want too little, it needs to be just right. Now that we have the basics fresh in our minds, let's take a look at the three papers demonstrating positive effects of ketones on inflammation. The first paper we'll look at today addresses how long-standing, low-level inflammation that bubbles away in people with metabolic disease can be improved through a low-carb ketogenic diet. This paper was written in 2008 by some of the leading researchers in the keto space, Dr. Jeff Volek and Dr. Stephen Finney, who are pioneering the widespread adoption of the ketogenic diet through telemedicine, as well as conducting cutting edge research studies into the effects of the diets. The title of this paper is Comparison of Low Fat and Low Carbohydrate Diets on Circulating Fatty Acid Composition and Markers of Inflammation. Published in the journal Lipids, this study looked at the effects of a 12 week long ketogenic diet on blood biomarkers in 40 overweight men and women who had metabolic syndrome. Another quick bit of important background here. Metabolic syndrome is generally defined by high fasting glucose, high triglycerides, high blood pressure, 
and waist circumference and low HDL cholesterol. New markers that appear to be associated with metabolic syndrome include disturbed circulating fatty acid composition, perturbed lipid metabolism, increased oxidative stress and inflammation. Fatty acids themselves contribute to overall inflammation by several mechanisms. In a subset of sensor cells called macrophages, fatty acids activate receptor signaling, leading to activation of a transcription factor that regulates over 100 genes. Many of these downstream genes have roles in the inflammatory response and atherosclerosis, and may therefore represent a crucial link between fatty acids, metabolic syndrome, and atherogenesis. Another way that fatty acids contribute to inflammation is through conversion into pro-inflammatory metabolites, either by enzymes or by reaction with oxygen-based free radicals. Okay, back to the study. The participants were asked to follow a diet that was either low fat with less than 10% of calories from fat or a diet that was around 60% calories from fat, so nearly keto. They had weekly follow-up counseling and kept week-long diet diaries for week one, six, and 12 of the study. They had blood samples taken in the morning after an overnight fast at the start and then again at the end of the study. This paper describes the changes in the amounts and types of fatty acids in the blood pre and post diet, along with the levels of inflammatory mediators that could be related to these fatty acids. In terms of overall changes in their metabolic syndrome, the researchers found there was a clear advantage of the low-carb diet over the low-fat diet. The keto group lost more weight, more fat mass, had better glycemic control, improved insulin sensitivity, and better blood work, specifically with regard to triglycerides and HDL, which is known informally as the healthy kind of cholesterol. Cholesterol is a hefty and nuanced topic, so please make sure to go back and check out our podcast episode with Dave Feldman. I've listened twice already and each time I learned something new. The researchers also looked at biomarkers that might indicate that someone was at risk for cardiovascular disease with a detailed analysis of lipoprotein types and ratios. These markers also went in favor of the ketogenic diet group. What about the main area of interest here? inflammation. Despite the two diet groups consuming roughly the same amount of caloric intake and all losing at least some weight, there were larger reductions in the keto group in many biomarkers of inflammation. The levels of the mediator molecules TNF-alpha, IL-8, MCP1, E-selectin, and ICAM all went down. These markers showed little change on the low-fat group, suggesting that it is the macronutrient, not weight loss or caloric restriction, being the key here. The researchers noted that most of the inflammatory markers did not correlate with weight loss. A correlation would not have proved that weight loss caused the change in the inflammatory markers, but the lack of correlation makes it extremely unlikely. I'm gonna throw out a curveball here. One result that does not fit the expected picture is that the low-fat dieters had lower levels of the pro-inflammatory fatty acid that was mentioned earlier, arachidonic acid, levels were actually increased in the keto group. The researchers suggest that the increase in plasma arachidonic acid with the keto group is best explained by decreased degradation, which is presumably due to less interaction with reactive oxygen species. If more arachidonic acid is consumed in a higher fat diet and less arachidonic is broken down into those pro-inflammatory downstream end products, the net effect would be less inflammation and more arachidonic acid in the membranes. The paper suggests that rather than being a negative factor within lipid membranes, increased arachidonic acid appears to be a beneficial outcome of weight-reducing diets. This paper is now often cited as one of the first studies that really started to unpick the beneficial non-weight loss effects of the ketogenic diet, and there certainly were some striking observations. Okay, so let's go on to our second paper. So we have seen that the ketogenic diet can alter overall inflammation status, but the previous paper focused in on the role of fatty acids from the diet on blood lipid profiles, presumably because fat consumption increases so much on the ketogenic diet. But in 2015, a new paper was published in the journal Nature Medicine that revealed that it might not just be the type and amount of fat and carbs in the diet that's regulating inflammation. This study described that the key endpoint biomarker of the ketogenic diet, beta-hydroxybutyrate itself, could directly affect inflammation. The paper was titled Ketone Body Beta-Hydroxybutyrate blocks the NLRP3 inflammasome-mediated inflammatory disease. Through a series of really quite elegant studies, the researchers described how the compound BHB directly inhibits NLRP3, which is part of a complex set of proteins called the inflammasome. The inflammasome is part of our innate immune system, and it directly drives the inflammatory response in several disorders, autoimmune diseases, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, atherosclerosis, and autoinflammatory disorders. So it was really exciting, as BHB 
GHB is a key biomarker linking the anti-inflammatory effects we just heard about with respect to the ketogenic diet with the well-known inflammation-busting effects of fasting and calorie restriction. So up until this study pointed the finger at BHB, it was unclear how immune cells adapted to reduced availability of glucose in all these states, and if the cells could respond to metabolites produced by fat oxidation. Working with mice and human immune cells, the researchers focused on how macrophages, specialized immune cells that produce inflammation, respond when exposed to ketone bodies and several different other types of noxious or harmful stimuli, and ultimately whether the BHB impacts the inflammasome complex. The cell experiment showed that BHB inhibited the inflammatory cascade in a dose-dependent way. What's more, the doses that they tested were 1 to 10 millimolar, so in the same range as the levels that one could get through fasting, the ketogenic diet, or exogenous ketones. They also tested other ketone bodies, acetoacetate, the molecule butyrate, and these compounds did not have a helpful effect. But very interestingly, there was some activity of the non-natural form of BHB, LBHB. The researchers looked at other types of inflammation, not just NLRP3, and they found that BHB was specific and only interacted with the NLRP3 pathway. They then dug around using different methods to target all the possible ways that BHB might actually have this effect. They looked at oxidative stress, changes in internal metabolites, which weren't important, before finding that effect of BHB on the flux of the ion potassium into the cells was the key. Armed with this new understanding from their in vitro experiments, the researchers did animal in vivo experiments to see if these effects occurred in the whole organism. So firstly, they took mice and injected them with BHB that was modified so that it wasn't cleared by metabolism as quickly as usual. They then injected a bacterial toxin called LPS, which strongly activates the inflammasome. In the BHB injected mice, there were fewer white cells that migrated to the site of infection and lower levels of pro-inflammatory mediators. They also looked at a genetically modified mouse that rapidly developed an inflammatory condition of the joint called gout. In these mice, they then used an acetoacetate ketone diester to raise ketone levels and saw that this was protective against some of the symptoms of gout. The researchers conclude very neatly, our findings suggest that the fasting or exercise-induced metabolite, BHB, inhibits the NLRP3 inflammasome in immune cells independently of binding to surface signaling receptors or undergoing mitochondrial oxidation. Thus, in states of extreme energy deficit, such as starvation, metabolic signals such as BHB can dampen innate immune responses, sparing energy for the functioning of ketone-dependent organs such as the brain and the heart. So to me, while it makes sense, and is a really nice story, that we evolutionarily needed to dampen the immune response to spare energy during energy scarcity, the practical utility of these observations in the modern setting is even more impactful. So many pernicious conditions are driven by uncontrolled or unnecessary inflammation. So the observation that a molecule like BHB that we can boost in many simple ways could help us to control this problematic process is exciting and could have very broad applications. But there's still a lot of work to be done to work out how much BHB could contribute in many different conditions where inflammation is a problem. And finally, let's dive on into our third paper of today. After the breakthrough study that we just discussed, more and more and more papers have been published specifically looking at the role of BHB and the NLRP3 inflammasome in several different disease models. The final paper we'll talk about today was published just recently in January 2019 in the journal PLOS1, and it is titled The Activation of Retinal HCA2 Receptors by Systemic Beta-Hydroxybutyrate Inhibits Diabetic Retinal Damage Through Reduction of Endoplasmic Reticulum Stress and the NLRP3 Inflammasome. It's quite a short and sweet set of experiments that uses a mouse model of diabetes to look at inflammation in the back of the eye, which is called the retina. The retina is the light sensitive part of our eye that is responsible for seeing in detail. Retinal damage is one of the most common complications of diabetes that no one talks about, occurring in about half of type 1 and type 2 diabetics, and it's a major cause of several visual impairments leading to adult blindness. The potential of going blind as a result of poor blood sugar control probably does not get enough airtime and was something that I found personally terrifying when I learned about just how common this is. Part of what causes diabetes-induced retinal damage is a chronic, 
low-grade inflammatory state. This results in the increased leakiness of the blood retinal barrier and ultimately leads to lack of sufficient blood supply and cell damage. In this study, the researchers wanted to find out if BHB had any effect on retinal inflammation in a mouse model of diabetes. They wanted to look and see if there was a role of the NLRP3 pathway, but also if there was an extra effect of BHB binding to a cell surface receptor called HCA2. It was already known that BHB could bind to HCA2 and that the receptor when active had some anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects that could also play a protective role. The researchers made the mice diabetic using injection of a toxin that could kill off cells in the pancreas. They then injected the mice with BHB at increasing doses, reaching blood ketone levels of 0.2 up to one millimolar. The first thing that they saw was that the mice with diabetes had higher levels of HCA2 and higher levels of cellular stress markers. In the diabetic mice that had been injected with BHB, there were fewer signs of NLRP3 activation. Specifically, the inflammatory mediators IL1-beta and IL-18, these were lower. In essence, this demonstrates that BHB was directly protective against inflammation in the eye that results from diabetes. To me, this paper is certainly interesting and expands on the potential use cases and indications for methods that can elevate BHB. However, the study is overall less complete than the previous paper we just discussed. This leaves me with a few unanswered questions. The researchers spend a while talking about HCA2 and the effect of BHB, but to be sure there's effect, that perhaps they should have either used a pharmacological blocker of HCA2 or else genetically modified their mice to not express HCA2 and to see if this changed the degree of benefit offered by BHB. That way they could have ensured that there was more of a connection. Clearly NLRP3 is involved and the results here support that, but it's not that clear about HCA2. Just because it's known that BHB binds to HCA2, it doesn't mean that this is a driving factor for the beneficial effects that the authors describe in the retina. So. There we are. It's pretty tremendous to see how rapidly our understanding of inflammation has grown in the last few decades as analytical techniques have got more and more sophisticated. To restate some of the points in this episode, we've talked about how changing fatty acid profiles of the ketogenic diet can affect inflammation, but also about how the key endpoint of the ketogenic diet, BHB, also can directly regulate inflammation. It's really interesting to speculate about the relative contribution of diet, for example, what types of fat you eat and how much fat you eat, and BHB on inflammation, diet versus BHB. As yet, there just aren't well-run studies that can directly contrast the ketogenic diet with the isolated effect of giving BHB through an exogenous source. And for me, this is one of the biggest questions that researchers need to address. On that somewhat reflective note, that is all for this month's podcast roundup, listeners. So as always, please write in to podcast at hvmn.com with any questions, topic suggestions, or feedback. HVMN also has a great line of health and performance products, including our newest releases, Fasting Aid, Keto Collagen Plus, and MCT oil powder. So go and visit hvmn.com forward slash pod to check them out. Until next time, study smart, train hard, and live well.